Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 310 for Wednesday, June 30th, 2021. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors today include pro.ultimateears.com, a new sponsor for us, but not a new company to discuss here on the show. We will discuss them and their current promotion more in depth a little bit later in the episode. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. You're in Napomo, California. It's Paul Kent. How's the... Uh, How's the weather out there, Mr. Kent? Is it, are you having heat wave ish? Like it seems most of the country is no down here in in the central coast of California, they have this thing called the June gloom where it's, Ah. it's actually pretty foggy because we were about, I'm about two miles from the ocean yeah. and uh, we've had a couple of nice days, but, um, and I did not know this, that it would be like this. Mm. We moved here in August and it was spectacular from August through January. And I'm like, it must be this way year round, but evidently this is their winter, our, oh, our winter. Right. I, your winter. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah, not like so San Diego where, you know, the temperature varies more than two degrees from 74 and, and, you yeah, know, it's panic no. in the streets. That's right. That's yeah. like, that's like 500 miles South, 300 yeah. miles South of there. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's the Southern tip, but uh, yeah, here it's um, kind of like, Cloudy 60s, sun breaks through mid-afternoon, mm. 70s for a little while, and then uh, the fog comes in off the ocean again, you know, late afternoon. And and it's been mostly like that for the month of June. Which interesting. Is interesting. Yeah. yeah we, we've been, I mean, I just, we have had nothing like the people in Portland, Oregon have had with, you know, 130 oh, degree God. temperatures. Yeah. Who has? I, no, that's India. the thing is I, right. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to downplay any of that, but it has been hot here, like, like a hundred degree days every day for the last four or five days, which is, uh, which wow. is atypical any time of year for us, especially I'll say this early in the summer. Um, yeah. but, um, but it, you know, it's, it's, it's been fine. I mean, it, you know, it's fine. We, you know, we have air conditioning and the power stayed on and like, it's no problems. And we had, um, I had two bitter pill gigs. Well, technically I guess I had three bitter pill gigs this weekend. Uh, we had one on Saturday night. It was a two set gig at flight coffee in Dover. And what a pleasure that gig was. It was, um, house sound. Actually both gigs had house sound, which takes some of the pressure off of us. Um, the bands, the band's just really starting to gel, you know, uh, as a, as a band, we're, we're really starting to get comfortable together on stage with, with the, the songs that we're playing now, the, the way the things are organized, we get to a, a good feeling, we get to a gig, we, everybody knows what they're doing. Like, I mean, we've, we've all, we've been playing together in various capacities for many years, but like this, this current sort of post COVID world is starting to become it, it's gelling on stage, you, you know, very much so. Um, yep. And, and it's great. We're having a blast playing together and Saturday night's gig really for me was the first, uh, maybe last, maybe the previous weekend's gig sort of showed some of that, but, but coming into Saturdays, I knew it was going to happen as opposed to the, the, the week prior where it happened. It was like, Oh, right. Okay, good. Like we're here. Um, Saturday, Friday's Friday's gig, Saturday's gig at flight coffee was, was very much that band played well, everybody was chill. You know, the, the crowd was super into it. Big crowd, uh, felt like it had, it was sold out. I'm not sure if it was or not, but certainly felt like that way. And then, and that was indoors. So that was our first, officially our first indoor gig, public gig of, um, of 2021. And then on, on Sunday, we played, uh, outside in Portsmouth, New Hampshire at the music hall. They, set up last year, they set up um, a stage and tables and stuff in the street right outside of the music hall. Although now if, if it had rained, we would have just done the gig inside. Uh, But uh, it was hot on Sunday afternoon. And we, we, when I say we technically played three gigs, we had two shows there back to back. We had a five o'clock show. Then they cleared the house, brought in a new set of people. And then we had a seven o'clock show. So we basically played the same set for both. We tweaked a couple of tunes um, between them, but that was hot. Uh, you know, cause it was hundred degrees or whatever. And we were getting there at three o'clock in the afternoon to set up. Mm. But again, that, you know, the band, you know, still firing on all cylinders, having fun, relaxed, you know, all of that. 
Um, but there's like, there's something happening with this band in terms of the people that are coming to the gigs, the people that are singing our songs, the people mm. that are dancing in the street, quite literally behind the stage. Like there's a, there's a, there's a thing developing, a scene developing. And I had forgotten what that was like. Um, you know, the, I, well, I definitely had it when I was on the road with the clam bake, but I wasn't there when that, when it developed with the clam bake, obviously they, you know, they had, or maybe not, obviously they, they hired me for just a tour after they really had established themselves. Um, but you know, I saw it, we go figure in, in, uh, in college and RITA, the band we had in high school. And, um, it, you know, you, you, that, that lightning in a bottle kind of thing feeling is there with this. We had it with, with the show that we called bitter pill in Portsmouth uh, for a brief moment uh, in time where it just became bigger than us. And by that sort of specifically, I mean, there's people showing up at the gigs that, that we don't know they're wearing our t-shirts. They're, you know, they know our songs. They like, they're interested in, what the band is doing for the sake of the band, not because, Oh, I know Dave or I know Emily or, you know, I, but you know, John or Billy or whatever, you know, it's, it's, they're into that's the band that, for the band. That's that second concentric circle, right? You build your foundation based upon just kind of like willpower, you know, especially yeah. in, in bands that are like all those bands that you, that you described through your life. Those are different types of audience acquisition type things, right? Yeah. You know, a high school band, like you're the cool kids in high school. College band, you're the scene where people can meet everybody. That's right. You know, a, adult bands, you're the club scene guys, right? But this, the concept of being a band when you're, let's just say, what do you say? Over 35, maybe, right? <laughs> sure. The, although That's we do have some for. people in the band under 35, right? Wow. But, but Good for you. Well, I mean, it's Billy, you know, B Billy and I are almost the same age. And then uh, Billy's daughter is Billy's daughter. So she's a few years older than my daughter, but not that much. That, not that much older. So there's, there's definitely two generations on stage. And then Emily's boyfriend, Mike is also in the band. So, so that, that dynamic is there. But what's interesting is the, the, the crowd, certainly there are people of all ages in this sort of developing crowd, but, um, but there's, there's a sizable percentage of them that are older people. It like, and there were, there were even some friends of mine that showed up at the gig that had no idea that I played in this band. Like they are like, Oh, are you here for the show? Wait, you know, and they kind of looked at my clothes. My, my friend Dave saw my inners. He's like, are you playing drums today? And I'm like, yeah, I, you know, I play drums in this band. And he's like, Oh, holy crap. I had no idea. But like he and all the friends that they were with knew the songs and like were into the band, which was really, really interesting that, you know, whatever, however it was exposed to them was not because of me. You know, and that, that's it. Like I said, there's, there's a scene developing and it's, it's fantastic. I, you know, and I, it's, it's different with an original band when you've got, you know, people focusing on your music. I, frankly, it may, I think it makes it easier, but, and it makes the connection a little bit uh, deeper or an, a deeper connection easier is perhaps a, a better way to say that. Uh, but, but it's been a while since I've really experienced that. Uh, and I, you know, it's, Exciting. It, yeah, it's not the kind of thing that, that you, that's a guarantee our, our guitar player, John and I, he, at the same time I was in go figured, um, our guitar player, John McCormick was in a band called fly spinach fly. Oddly, we played a gig together, had no idea until about four years ago. Uh, but, uh, we played a battle of the bands together and his band beat us, which, you know, still sort of sticks in my craw, but, uh, which is probably why I remember the name of his band when he mentioned it. I'm like, wait, that was you. But, um, but, you know, he experienced that with, with Fly Spinach Fly. I, I certainly experienced it with Go Figure at the time. And neither one of us expects to, to experience that again. Like, it's, it's not a guarantee that you start a band and, and even stick with it. And then, you know, this, this magic starts to happen. And, you know, the nice part is this time around, we know that it's not a guarantee. Whereas the first time for both of us was like, Oh, this is how it works. You start a band and you know, people love you. It's awesome. It's amazing. You know, <laughs> it's, just, it's not always the case it turns out. And so it's like a little more of that perspective, like uh, I'm going to do everything I can to preserve it, but I'm also going to like, first and foremost, do everything I can to enjoy and, yeah. and, and allow everyone, including the people that are coming to the gigs to enjoy this moment 
And that, that, that's a pretty cool thing. So I'm, um, I'm curious to see where it goes. And of course, you know, anything can happen as we know. So, <laughs> yeah, but you know, that you're sensing that there's this groundswell and yeah. you have some history. I mean, I don't know if the other people in your band do, but that you have yeah. some history to like discuss it with your band about how to guide it and nurture it and feed it. And you know, that it, I, I don't say this boastfully, but it, when I started the house rockers, maybe because of the types of music that I listen to and the types of people that I identify with. I mean, music and community are kind of interlocked things, right? And so to me, it, that was always the proof, you know, from the beginning, right? Uh, the, the proof point as to whether we were going over is like, were we building an audience? Where, you know, and, and always kind of a sense that, well, if I've got fans and all these places that book people want to sell beer or sell whatever, I should be able to write my ticket, right? So it made sense to me on a few different levels and also was kind of in my historical background of the types of bands that I followed um, that that, you know, is the is the goal to pursue. Not yep. that we would be successful at it. Sure. But that was the path. That was part of the plan from the beginning. That's it. And yeah. I'm kind of, you know, one for one in doing this with the House Rockers. Um, uh, and I've been able to leverage that into the solo stuff that I do quite by design, right? And they feed into each other. Like I don't do a solo gig without telling people what's going on with the house rockers. I mean, to me, if people want to follow me as a musical person, here's all the things that, you know, I can do for you type of thing. So, um, yeah, so I think it's great, you know, and it starts with good music. I think very close to good music. It starts with a believable, true vibe that comes off the stage that the band is something that people want to buy into. Totally. They want to be, they want to connect to, they want to be a part of. Yep. You know, this is why it's, uh, uh, we have this kind of brotherhood thing in the house rockers. And, um, you know, I was fairly careful about the guys I picked to be in the band, not always the absolute best musician, always a good musician. And I fired, you know, several guitar players because they just literally weren't getting the, the connection vibe and they were would take away from it on stage. And so, you know, it, it's been a building thing that you're this, you're, you're sensing it this soon into, into your band's, you know, maturity, I think is a really cool thing. And yeah, it just, I think it just pretends a lot of really poor tens, a lot of, um, a lot of cool success for you. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very thankful to be involved in enjoy it in this. And I'm, I am right. That's it. Like that's the part that I'm doing differently this time around. <laughs> it's like, I'm just like prioritizing, enjoying it, not obsessing about how much better it can get. I mean, like I'll, I'll focus on that and work on that and happily, yeah. but not losing sight of, Hey, this is a moment too. Right. So yeah. yeah. Put, put this in, in, uh, in our pocket. We can talk about it later, but um, it's an interesting thing. That happens when you have guys in and girls, people in the band who have a a shared sense of desire for it to happen, right? Like, you, like it's the difference between teamwork and individuality, which is something I want to talk about a little bit later. You mm. know, as we kind of talk about band configurations, but um, I I think uh, you you can will that into existence in certain ways. You know, I think you can will it into existence by being good musicians, playing good music, having a honest connection point. And that honesty can be whatever it is, whatever it is to you. We've talked about whether, you know, the 50 year old overweight guys, you know, wearing tight leather jeans and bandanas on their heads. Does it come across as true or does it come across as parody? Right. Right. And if it's, if it's intentional parody, you might be able to write it. If it's unintentional parody, you know, you're kind of a joke, right? So, <laughs> you're well, right. I mean, that's the thing. If right. you think no, it's you're being serious be, and people are buying it. It's got to be so true. Yeah, right. It's got to be sure. truth. Absolutely. Yeah. So I had a I had a really interesting weekend. We had our first public gig. You know, we did the secret gig last week. Right. We had our first public gig um, uh, outdoor at this great brewery that we've been playing at for many years. Super crowd, hot day. Uh, when we started at 6 p.m., Sun was still kind of high, so people kind of like. When you say we, you're, you're talking about the house rockers, right? Did the house rockers house play rockers, three yeah. times this weekend, or or one time? One time, we, we, okay. Friday, and then I had solo gig Saturday and got, Sunday. Got it, got it. Um, you know, it was our full big sound system, and so you know, Bill was out there. We put our lights up. Um, great crowd, so many familiar faces, so many people just excited to hear live music, see us again. It was a really like vibrantly high thing. My brother flew out from Atlanta. <laughs> 
totally surprised me, ran up to the stage. You know, it was one of those, it was like cognitive dissonance, right? I see him walking towards the stage and my brain is going, that kind of looks like my brother, but it can't be my brother. He lives in Atlanta, right? And then he's at the stage and it all kind of clicks in. So we, and it happened to be the last song of the first set, ended the song and, uh, you know, there he was. It was really cool. That's that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. That's better than so, Barry coming to your gig. No offense, Barry. <laughs> there you go. And yep. yeah, Barry the week before. Yep. Oh, I do want to say something. You know, I I always get a huge kick out of it when uh, musicians come up who listen to Gig Gab, right? So this sure. really nice guy, Adam Russell from a band called The Undercovers in Central California, uh, came up during the first set, very complimentary. He was with a bandmate of his. He goes, yeah, we came out to hear you. We listened to Gig Gab, and which thank you, Adam, for doing that. I, I still just think of this as you're in my weekly check-in conversation, right? So yeah. whenever there's a hint that the outside world is kind of, you know, <laughs> connecting to what we're doing here, it just is a blast to me. So he was a really nice guy. You know how when you're playing, you can kind of pick out the musicians. Totally. They often are like towards the back with their arms folded, like kind <laughs> of expressionless. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. These guys were, you know, kind of into it. And it was funny. He came up to me after the second said, he goes, oh, you guys are doing some really interesting things. We're sitting here on the side, and we're like, "Well, what would we do with that song, and how would we do that with our instrumentation?" And and uh, it was just kind of a cool conversation. So anyway, thanks again, Adam Russell. Very cool to meet you in person. Um, I want to I want to share it, our. I want to talk about our sponsor. I have. I I, I want to. Well, I want to yell at myself, but I'm I'm going to do it by yelling at you for suggesting mm. for accidentally, unintentionally suggesting an idea that I took and ran with. Uh, did you have one more thing about your gigs, though? I, it sounded like I was cutting you off. Um, actually, I, all I want to say is gig went well, very well. Band played quite well. Not perfect. We're not there yet. Um, but, we're, you know, it's great to be back in there. But um, last couple of songs, my voice started going south. Oh. And, you know, and I couldn't tell what the hell was going on. There was no power behind it. It was definitely hoarse. And, you know, I've been singing every day all through the pandemic and I've done all these acoustic gigs and I can play five, six, seven acoustic gigs in a row. So my technique is pretty solid, you know, for doing this stuff. And I was like, am I falling back into bad habits? Am I screaming mm. to get over the band, um, you know, or to express? And so I'll, I'll pause here. Last thought being the voice started to go. I definitely was feeling a cold come on and was real hoarse and congested on Saturday took a bunch of drugs and actually got through the gig on uh, like, like um, Mucinix D cleared me out. And, and I was able to, I had a good night on Saturday, but woke up Sunday and I was like a train wreck hit me and my acoustic gig Sunday, I felt terrible. A lot of people from house rocker land came out to hear it. My voice was pretty shot. I sang a couple of Johnny Cash songs and, you know, a couple of really low register. Yeah. Songs. yeah. <laughs> but I played a lot of instrumentals on Sunday and uh, you know, to get through it. So uh, don't, but Simon got sick also and Mendoza got sick also. Mm. So something happened on Friday night that got all of us. Yeah. We, and in my head, we had that in the Amanda, thought, in the Amanda band where, where uh, at least two of us got sick. It wasn't COVID. You know, I, I actually, this week is the first week that I'm just stopping with the, the weekly COVID test. It, it became optional for, for people on the UNH testing plan if you're vaccinated. And so I was like, you know, I've been doing it for a little while cause it's free and it's super easy and it's been kind of nice, you know, as we've been doing gigs to know that yeah. like it's not COVID. And then especially when, when that cold, that head cold presented itself, it was like, okay, Hey guys, I can tell everybody, you know, I, I just got tested PCR lab, no COVID. I think it's just, I mean, remember we we've, shielded our immune systems from everything for yeah. over a year. Like yeah. we're not really in the best place. I wonder if we should put the masks back. In well, <laughs> yeah. Loading in and out with a mask sucks though. I will tell you I that bet. it gets pretty sweaty, man. <laughs> yeah. So my yeah. last thought on this is, and I think you'll appreciate this in my mind, when I set up these little, you know, mini tours for myself to come up to the yeah. Bay area, you know, player in my mind, they're butter. You know, I, I stroll in happily on a, on a, on a, magic carpet the gigs are butter i feel great you know all the hugs are there i get a good night's sleep i get a good you know three meals a day and it just is in my mind it's nirvana this weekend was like uh, you know just didn't feel great everything was, was was hot it was you know a lot of stress and a lot of pressure great to play but uh you know be careful what you wish for right yeah yeah for sure yeah 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 right because all of those things that can get in the way of it 
are now also factors again when whereas they weren't when we weren't playing but yep, yeah there's all those things yeah hey uh speaking of getting back to playing again right like we're able to use all our gear and that includes our in-ears and our sponsor to celebrate ultimate ears starting today is offering huge discounts on some of their most popular in-ear monitor models on top of that, Paul, they are giving away a free UE Switch interchangeable faceplate upgrade when you buy any UE Pro custom model. So that's three faceplates for the price of one. It's a $200 value. This is a cool thing. So like when I got my Ultimate Ears, I've had uh, a few sets of them over the years. I've been, I've been fortunate. But, you know, you, you get them and the faceplate that comes with them is the faceplate that you have. Well, now with UE Switch, you can change those faceplates out yourself and change your look. Maybe, you know, with one band, you have like, you know, like you've got something crazy with, with like your crazy band. And then you've got, you know, maybe just a uh, skin toned one for those times when you, you want people, you know, you want it to sort of blend in or whatever. Right. Like this is the beauty. You can customize these things as part of your your stage costume. Very cool stuff. I've I've these days I use the UE 11 Pro Ambience. And they have been, uh, as I've mentioned on the show, I'm sure if any, if you've listened to more than about three episodes, you probably know this already, but, uh, but they, they are the ones with four balanced armatures in, uh, in each ear and they've worked amazingly well for me, um, in all kinds of environments, acoustic, obviously on the, uh, you know, electric on the, or not, not electronic, but full electric band on the kit and, and everything in between. Um, it's been great. You use the UE seven pros, right, Paul? Yeah, I do. Yeah, so I, and I I never heard the the other ones with more drivers, so I can't really compare how they are. But yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I had the UE sevens before, and then I lost one, and and so wound up upgrading to the UE elevens when uh, when I had to replace, and it it made it made a difference for sure. But I was not unhappy with the UE sevens, so they've got they've got something for everybody, and you can go check it out. Go visit uh, pro dot dot com. Remember this, this offer with all their discounts is limited time only. So you got to go check it out now. Pro dot dot com. And our thanks to ultimate ears for sponsoring this episode and for doing what they do. Uh, I, I, I mentioned that I, I had to, I have to blame you for something because otherwise mm -hmm. if I don't, I have to blame myself, which is really where all of it lies. You talked about how much fun this public rehearsal slash secret gig was that you did. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm in the process of prepping for a madhouse, uh, it's the first one since, you know, uh, things have reopened here. Although I'm finding out that the theater is still requiring masks inside, which is a little weird considering that nothing else around here is, but whatever, um, it is reopened, right? The people will be there in the house, uh, watching. And, uh, and so it was supposed to be tonight. That was the planned date for this performance. And a couple of weeks ago, um, the people organizing it sort of reached out and said, Hey, we have the opportunity. We have the availability in the theater to move it back a week to next Wednesday. And that gives us another week of prep time, which is always in short supply for Madhouse. It's always, you know, it comes together very last minute. We learn the right. songs as best as we can. We go do it. It's fun. The crowd understands that it, you know, but we always, you know, there's always something where it was like, eh, I wish we'd had a little more time with that. Right. So it was like that, that was attractive to us. And I said, sure. Yeah. They asked everybody, you know, are you available to do this, you know, a week later and turned out everybody said yes. But, you know, when I said yes, I, uh, it was right after we had had one of our conversations about your thing. And I said, well, the first thing I said, which I think was a good idea was, Hey, at the moment, we know that we're all available today on the 30th. If we're going to push it back, let's keep this date and use it as a rehearsal so that we actually take advantage of this extra time instead of simply kicking the can down the road and re preparing it at the last minute mm -hmm. next week after the holiday weekend, you know, like, and, uh, and they're like, Oh, that's a good idea. And that's where I should have stopped with my ideas. You know, I get excited about things, Paul. I get um, my I know my excitement can be infectious and uh, perhaps accidentally persuasive at times. And so my next suggestion was, hey, you know, not only are we available, but all the people that bought tickets to this thing are available. What if we open the doors and give them sort of a voyeuristic uh, experience of watching us rehearse? And I really didn't think that idea would go anywhere. <laughs> I think you know where this story ends, my friend. <laughs> uh, and we have an open rehearsal tonight. Now, I am 
I hate open band rehearsals. Like I hate having guests at band rehearsal. It, you know, yeah. like it, it always, it, as soon as there's someone new in the room, I mean, if it's your sound engineer or something that's used to being there, you eventually, you know, that person sort of becomes invisible, right? They become just like another band member or whatever, right? You, you don't think about it. But, but that new person that shows up, even if they are a trusted confidant, whatever, like everybody's performer switch turns on at least a little bit, if not a lot bit. And you stop focusing fully on the rehearsal aspect of it. And, th and there's some amount of the performance that is, that is a distraction in that moment. And I don't know. I, I know how I am with it. I don't like it. I know I'm the one that suggested it fully aware. Uh, but I'm, I at least am, aware of what the experience is like and can sort of prepare myself going into it. I have no idea. It, let, let me just put it this way. This, there's a bunch of theater people that are suddenly going to have an audience. I, I don't know how capable each of them will be. And they're all professionals. Don't get me wrong. Like, they, you know, but, but still, if you haven't done this before and uh, learned to turn off the switch and focus primarily on being a rehearsal, I worry that tonight will turn into more of a performance when it's literally the first time we're getting together for this kind of thing in, you know, a year. And especially it's the first time for this, this show. So we need to, um, we need to rehearse. So I'm curious to see how tonight goes. I'm, I'm starting to just accept it though. Like, you know, th these people could have been getting a show tonight and, they would have been entertained by that show because they're sort of in the vibe. So maybe I just yeah. need to let it happen and let it be a thing and, and not overthink it, but we've met and you know me. And so it's hard for me not to overthink it. All you go. Yeah. It'll be fine. Yep. I mean, again, you, it, it's not a, you're not performing brain surgery. B, Correct. nobody will die if there's a mistake. Right. right. That's, that's, that's probably true. one of the most, that is one of the most useful pieces of advice that a professional musician ever gave me. We're not saving no, lives here. <laughs> nobody died. You're exactly. Yeah. So, you know, that it's a good perspective to have. I told you my, one of my favorite Springsteen quotes is the key is that what you're doing is the, the balance between it's the most important thing you can do at any one moment and the most frivolous thing you can be doing at any moment. If you can balance those two ideas in your head, you've got something successful. And that's truly it, right? Like this is, there's, I mean, I'll make a little bit of money from this, but you know, like it's, it's, it's not a ton. It's right. So this is, this is, this is to do for the frivolity of it. And, and any one of us would understand if, you know, if somebody said, oh my gosh, I have like some event happening in my life. Everybody'd be like, oh, go do that. Like, this is not yeah. important. Right. So remind me, what is the connection between, uh, is Billy involved with madhouses? No. Okay. Two totally separate things. Yes. Okay. Got it. Yes. Yeah. Your, your musical theater life is just a blur to me of all the things. That uh, I mean, every things have always sort of intertwined. I mean, my musical theater life wouldn't have happened without here in New Hampshire. Anyway, wouldn't have happened without fling because Russ's wife, uh, Lynette miles is, um, a, 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 like, she's a fantastic singer, like Broadway quality, uh, singer, uh, actor. And, so she was the one that she and Russ, but you know, it was because of her that I wound up getting roped into doing that next to normal show, uh, whatever it was seven years ago. And that was my sort of re entrance into musical theater in my life. And certainly my first entrance into musical theater here in New Hampshire. And then, you know, and then things sort of spiraled from there. <laughs> so sometimes not such in a good way, but it's all good. So Got it. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. So, ah, but so it'll, you know, it'll be interesting. About Go ahead. Yeah. I've had these thoughts about um, we have a good running thread for many years now about the pluses and minuses of leader dictatorships and democracies and bands and everything in between. And, you know, you are interesting to me because you've observed my band and me, you know, pretty much know my whole musical journey. I mean, sure. really, we've been friends since. I didn't get the house rockers together very long before you and I started hanging out together. Right. Yeah. Started that's, in that's, 99. Yeah. That's right. About when we met. Yeah. 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 yeah so, yeah. you know, and so, uh, and then we both know each other well enough to know our personal qualities 
you know, and how it informs the decisions and the way we view things, which is helpful. And, uh, but you have a longer, deeper, you know, kind of range of musical experiences, right? I continue to feel as though if you're a semi-pro musician, a leader-led band with a good leader, with a good vision and a demonstrated ability to deliver on, you know, finding good gigs, um, that's, that's a good situation. Um, uh, a, a leader led band that goes nowhere is an incredibly frustrating situation. Democracies continue to be mysterious things to me because I don't ever think they're true democracies, right? Like I, I have yet to find a band and you know, there, there's someone out there listening who will probably say I'm wrong where the work is evenly distributed. Everybody wants to say into the decisions, but you know, who's doing the accounting, who's doing the booking, who's doing the marketing, who's, you know, who's buying and maintaining and storing the gear and, you know, all of the little things that go into being a, a working band. So, um, anyway, I, I've, I've had these decisions and certainly coming out of COVID and seeing, uh, how some new bands are now on the scenes that I'm involved with and, you know, some existing bands seem a little afraid. It's interesting to me, you know, the semi-professional musician, the guy who's been around for a while, again, we can't make absolutes. Sometimes those guys just want a good situation, you know, where they don't have to worry about stuff. They can come do what they love to do. And they're band guys and they're demonstrated band guys. But it's also important to understand that, that a musician, almost by definition, almost by, by brain wi wiring, is an individualistic person, right? Mm. And, you know, we're talking about you and we're talking about, you know, how your band is starting to, you know, create a scene around it. And my, my position is that's because you're giving a, a scene something to attach to. Individualistic approaches to making music together are, 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 are not supportive of that type of thing. I don't, yeah, I don't know that I agree with this as a truth. It, like, it, it certainly true of some, but it is not a universal truth, nor is it true about any one person all of the time. Right. Like, I mean, like you, you, you know, take me with bitter pill for example, like uh, it was several weeks ago, maybe even a couple months ago. It was like, okay, well, bitter pill is now my musical priority. Now music can't be my only priority in life, just because I've got, you know, businesses and a family and like my income stream and we need, I live in a, a scenario where income is required to, you know, to, to maintain the lifestyle that we have and keep our kids in school and all that good stuff. Um, as many of us do, most of us, in fact, <laughs> um, and music is not my primary source of income right now. So there it's definitely take playing it, it therefore must play second fiddle to that. Uh, but you know, I've gotten pretty good at navigating that. And the, the real trick is learning, uh, especially coming out of COVID, I, you know, how to juggle my musical schedule life. I'm reminded of our conversation with Kenny Aronoff where, you know, he just, he takes the gigs and says, I'll figure it out. I'll make it work. Um, because that's been a little bit my life lately with bitter pill is my priority. You know, we, and we, we all have made it our priority, um, and whether that means a different thing to each of us, I'm sure it does. I mean, you know, we're all different humans, but everybody's pretty committed to this thing. And, you know, as best we can moves things around so that we can do gigs together. And, you know, bitter pills is, is, is great in that sense, because we can, we are very modular, right? We can do gigs without all of us. Um, but it's gotten to the point where that's not our preference, uh, it will happen because it's how it goes. And that's, and again, we're very fortunate because we have that, but like, I, yeah, I don't, I, I think maybe, it, but I don't, also don't want to diminish the fact that this is, this has been your experience with musicians. Like, like, so it is true for you. And, and that like, I don't want to say that it hasn't because I know that it I don't has. think that my, my experience is the universal experience. Yeah. I, I, I would say that, um, in the same way in, that I had in my business, you know, I try to choose people carefully mm. because once there's a connection of trust, more things can get done, right? Yes. Once once you're assuming that someone's, you know, one foot in, one foot out, that breaks a lot of stuff down 
you know, in, in many ways, right? You know, if you can't count on somebody, that makes it hard. And, and let me just say this again for anybody who hasn't listened for years. I It's been a learning experience for me. I, when I started the band, my premise was, listen, I will do all the work, gleefully do all the work. I'll do all the booking. I'll do all the accounting. I'll do all the marketing. I will arrange for rehearsal places. I will do everything. Sure. But this is going to be my band. And, you know, you get to just come and, and play. Um, that was a naive assumption that that was going to be the magic ticket to get great players to just flock to <laughs> the situation. And over time, as I've, you know, gotten people who cross that line of, you know, that I can tell they would like to be all in, I've had to learn where and how to let the reins out a little bit in the interest of keeping an, an ongoing an ongoing thing ongoing and harmony and, and not, you know, having a revolving door of people playing. Right. You know, my, I, I had to ask myself, what is, what is it that I most want? And what I most wanted was to have a band that was an ongoing concern that meant something to people that, you know, once I could kind of define that very high, like what you're experiencing with bitter pull now, that it means something to people. Yep. That to me is what a musical expression, a musical project you know, should, should yield. So, so I had to really, and some of them were really hard for me to kind of give up some of the things that I, I intuitively, I didn't really want to give up. But once I was able to ask myself that question, look in the mirror and say, you know, and I could say, you know, where, where our band is, is a pretty good place. Uh, we, I, we, we meet that criteria on a fairly constant basis, right? I've gotten rid of the guys who didn't support that, I've um, figured out what's really important to me when something is challenging to me and my initial reaction is, but I'm the leader, I always have to check myself, right? And that has been, a, that is a personal growth of the last 22 years of going through that process of figuring out what's really most important. Sure. Is I, the person that I'm going to give this reign to more valuable to the bigger goal than fighting about the actual thing? Yeah, well, <laughs> that I understand. I live that world. I, you know, justice is something that I've wasted a lot of hours seeking. Um, and it often is, uh, it winds up kind of shooting me in the foot. Uh, but I do want to point out that as much as you have, like, evolved this, and, and I know, and I mean, anybody that listens to the show knows that you have evolved this. It's still, whether... In your mind, you are playing to yourself or anyone else the, yeah, but I'm the leader card. My guess is everyone else sees that card. And and I like just listening to how you talk about it here. It's you said I've let out the reins, you know, when I, I've decided to hire, I've decided to fire someone, I've decided to do this. It's never a weave. Right. Like there's, there's no, no, no I'm not fooling myself that, it, that, it, right. that what I'm saying is, you know, some people call it benevolent dictatorship. Yeah. I would just say. I am I am back a couple steps from total dictatorship, right? Sure, sure. Like, like well, we, in, we in, call um, fling a benevolent dictatorship uh, in that, you know, whenever there's an issue that needs to be resolved that is not all five of us on the same page, we all trust Russ to make that final decision. But the first place it lands is with the five of us, not with Russ. And Russ is... He's a he's a good benevolent dictator, um, but it's not where he like he doesn't step in and say this is how it's going to be. It's he would much rather not have to make the decision. Yeah. In in the confines of fling, I don't want to speak about the rest of his life, you know, but but in the confines of fling, he he would much rather have the decision be made by the by made as a we, not an I. And most things are. So, but again, like. You know, there's, there's different degrees of all of this stuff. Yeah. It's, it's not black and white, right? Like, I mean, he, your band is clearly a leader led band, but it's your leadership style. I mean, a, your leadership style today is different than your leadership style five years ago, even let alone yep. 10 or 20 years ago. And yep. v dramatically your leadership style is different from probably that of most other leaders of leader led bands. Right. So yeah. it's a, it's, it's not, there's no absolutes here. You figure out there's your path. No absolutes. Yeah. You, I mean, and what you've done with the, with the house rockers with that style that, you know, benevolent dictator mode has succeeded. Like, and well, 
And that's, a, that's an important me, thing to remember. <laughs> yes. But that's a confluence of me, my skill set, my decision making, you know, the guys that I've come through. So a lot of things had to line up in order to have the success. And I'm not naive to that. Sure. I will say, um, I will say that there are no absolutes, but there are trends. Like I said, I do believe many musicians are individual, uh, many human beings are, are approach music projects in an individualistic way. Sure. And if you're a guy who wants a band with people who are going to give their heart and soul and be the only thing they think about, you're not going to change that type of guy with your dazzling, you know, leadership, right? You know, guys who see their ability to play music as something they're going to do what they want with. And if another project comes along, you know, they, you, you may ask them, you know, what's your, what's, how do you handle, if you're going to play in multiple things, how do you handle, will you ever cancel on me to go do something else? Right. You know, right, those right. types of questions. So there are, uh, and, but then there are also the guys, and this is typically more when it comes to the, the weekend warrior dad band type of thing where they're just happy to be playing and they will give you a real commitment. Right. Sure. And you know, that's the, I, I'm actually finding as the world opens up again, a lot of people picked up the guitar over COVID. Right. Sure. Like, I mean, there's a lot of new <laughs> bands out there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the level of quality you can, you can judge for yourself, but there's a lot of new bands that are kind of rolling onto scenes and, and they all know somebody and they can all get one booking and they can all get their, they can all get their, you know, friends and family and neighbors out for one gig or maybe two gigs. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, will they be able to do it long term? And how does that, you know, how does that make a scene if you have a bunch of kind of semi-professional bands and the venues in your area? I, well, I, I the, love the, what you were the, saying before. The question comes down to uh, how many of those dad bands have, you know, the VP of marketing of some Fortune 500 company in there that understands the, you know, what it actually takes to market something and go forward. Those might be the ones that succeed, <laughs> right. but they might also yeah. be the ones that charge, you know, that understand what a fair wage is in the market and charge it and, and participate like responsibly. So that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just think you were, you were saying something about something brilliant. I said, and, and I don't want to let you lose that thought. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> because you, you said you're one brilliant thing. Um, <laughs> I only get that, one a year, so I got that audience that you're cultivating. You know, for for bitter pill, it's an interesting thing to watch, right? So, our audience with the house rockers is largely the people who are have rediscovered that they can get their house. Their kids are grown, or yeah. their marriage, or their marriage is gone. One of those two things sure. is a large part. Over thirty five, over forty, you know, getting out and you know supporting music. Of those people, you know, X percentage of them are there for the social scene. Y percentage of them are there because they really love music. Um, but getting getting lower, getting younger music fans is really to me, and that, that there's many more of them, right? I think if you can, if you are playing something, or if you are becoming something that's going to appeal to all ages, and that in that uh, uh, in that way, that's magic. I mean, yeah. that's the, the types of gigs that will open up to you. It's yeah. Well, and that, that's what we're noticing with bitter pill. You know, we like last weekend, we played that Eastman's farm gig and families were there and the kids were like super into it. Now there's, we tailored our set list mostly to avoid the songs that might be weird in that particular vibe. Um, not that we have anything like overly graphic or anything, but you know, we, we tailored the, we sort of stripped the things out that might not be appropriate in that, in that realm. Um, and we don't want to give parents too many questions to answer on the drive home from the gig, but, uh, but we give them a few, you know, it's fine. It's good to keep people talking. In fact, that's one of the things that bitter pill does is if we like, and Billy is a master at this, at getting people to sort of reflect on themselves and, and ask themselves questions they never thought they would ask. And I mean, that, that I, I think that's part of what art can do. And, and like I said, Billy's a master at, at crafting that to happen. We, we start most shows with a song called whiskey oxy and a couple of perks, which is from that show, the Brecktones that I did with Billy years ago. And, uh, 
and we get the groove going. And the first thing he asks is anybody here on drugs, you know, and, and then he goes through the list of, well, if we're, if we're at a bar, you have an alcohol, right? That's a drug caffeine. That's a drug. Did you take aspirin today? Like, you know, kind of going through the list and having people say, Oh, you know, sort of questioning their own internal definition of what drugs are, you know, and, and, right. and, but that's like, that's a bitter pill gig. Like you will, you will finish the gig having thought about something as it relates to yourself that you didn't think you were, you know, that, that you hadn't thought about before. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, but, but that works with kids as much as it does, you know, adults and, and, and everybody in between. Are there other people in between kids and adults? I don't know. Maybe that's musicians. Um, uh. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, like being able to, to reach people, all people or, or not all people, but people of, of lots of different age groups or demographic groups or whatever it turns out to be. That's, that's, that's what we're noticing is like, Oh, these aren't the people I expected to see here. These aren't the types of people I expected to see. So it's cool. I don't know. Something to do. Makes yeah. the weekends fun. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that it's taken off. That's really Same. fun to hear. I, yeah. Did I see that, that Flig is planning something? Uh, yes. Fling. We've been recording a lot of, originals um especially the last couple of months i mean we've sort of been working on it we we sh played one or two of them i think uh on the show here over the past year but russ has really uh he's got extra time in his schedule he's a teacher here at the university and so he has a summer off and so recording has become his job uh his his self-imposed job for the summer and so he's really been driving the bus on getting more songs finished and we're, we're getting there. And so we are putting together an all original night that probably will be happening this fall um, with other bands too. In fact, we're probably going to try and have bitter pill play as well. I mean, I'll be there. So, you know, it makes life a little bit easier for us all. So, um, but we've got a couple of bands that, that we're talking with about putting us together um, like a little festival E kind of thing. So we'll see what happens, but, uh, but it looks like it's coming together. Yeah. Some late summer, early fall kind of thing. So, yep. Yep. It's good. All right, man. Well, good news that the, that bitter pill is doing its thing. You got a lot of things happening. Well, you got a lot of things. Sure. We all have a lot of things happening. Like that's the, that's it. This is good news Wednesday, man. Like we we're talking about playing that. Think yeah. about th where we were a year ago. That's pretty good, man. I'll take it. Yep. I'll take it. Um, you got anything else? Before we uh, check out for the for the week, always be performing. Always, I'll say it, early. I'll say it strong. You say say it loud, say it proud, yep. and uh, make sure to check out those those uh, deals from Ultimate Ears at pro.ultimateears.com. The links in the Great show notes. Care. Big Gab Podcast. Yeah, love that stuff. Big fan I am, and thanks to them for sponsoring the episode. See you next week. Hey.